Thank you, Jenna. Thank you, everyone. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, so why don't we uh, shoot to, for me to speak for about 45 minutes, and then we can have time for questions. However, if you're comfortable and want to ask a question even while I'm speaking, that's fine. Just, just raise your hand. Uh, the topic, humanitarian futures, uh, is a great preoccupation right now in the humanitarian industry. Uh, this, uh, we uh, use a f term called early warning, uh, which is the kind of convention we try to look ahead by a couple months, six months ahead, try to predict uh, political crises and places that will demand uh, our work. But there's now a whole academic uh, uh, notion concerned around what's called humanitarian futures, looking at predicting events 10 uh, to 15 years uh, into the future. And uh, this is something that looks quite ominous. And I think you'll hear from some of the things I raise. Uh, there's some scary prediction about the future disaster and what that will look like. Um, and we need to prepare for it as professional aid organizations. We're embarked on sort of a, a critical analysis of the implications for us, how we can prepare for them, what they're going to look like, what is the uh, humanitarian landscape of the future. So they're quite, some of these things I'll talk about will seem uh, unfathomable and uh, uh, cataclysmic. And, and we have to look at the extreme uh, to try to, to, to plan for it. Now, an irony about this is that it will seem very gloomy uh, when you hear these sort of uh, predictions. But the fact is, this is occurring against a backdrop of unprecedented global prosperity and abundance never before seen in, in human history, right now, this moment. Worldwide standards of living, health status, longevity, child survival rates, democratization, political participation, literacy, gender equality, even decreasingly lethal armed conflicts. It's the best that's ever been seen in human civilization right now. So the cup is actually half full. But that's not what we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about the worst case scenario. Now, uh, <clears throat> obviously there are some trends that uh, uh, are enlightening us about what, what to predict in terms of the future, what, what are called mega trends. And they're kind of converging. And some of the examples I'll give you, uh, we'll, we'll see uh, how that's happening. Now, uh, the reason why I, I'm interested in this topic or I've been exposed to it is, is uh, uh, I also am part of a, uh, an effort in the disaster relief community that does something called uh, uh, real-time evaluations. This is becoming our best practice in the field. <clears throat> Rather than the tradition of evaluating something uh, <clears throat> after it's over and looking how we did, uh, which is the equivalent of taking care of yourself by waiting for the results of the autopsy. Mm -hmm. and real so you want to, in real time, <clears throat> learn what's going good, what's going bad, make mid-course corrections. So this is new notion of real-time evaluations uh, happening with the UN, Red Crosses, <coughs> NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and a variety of uh, international actors working together to do a global analysis. So I participated in the evaluations uh, last several, Haiti, pa last couple of earth, uh, uh, emergencies in Pakistan. We have an ongoing one right now happening in the Horn of Africa, the famine uh, and drought crisis there. So this is where a lot of my uh, input uh, uh, comes from. So anyway, we're looking at the mega trends, the convergence of factors. What are they? Climate change, urbanization, <coughs> global economic recession, water scarcity, fuel shortages, increasing land disputes, food price volatility, pandemics, organized crime, protracted conflict, irregular migration. So all these things are happening at the same time. Sometimes they intersect, and that's what produces a, 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 a worrisome a kind of trend that we're watching out for. It's predicted by 2030, 2030, the world will require 50% more food, 45% more energy, 30% more water. 
So one might expect resource wars, competition over water, land, and fuel. Then we're also noticing that the trend of natural disasters appears to be increasing in frequency, in duration, and in intensity. 2010, I hope, was a high water mark. There were 373 natural disasters. That's more than one disaster every day. Now, how does that compare? If you go back to the 1980s, about 120 natural disasters a year. So they are increasing. There's an incline trend. <clears throat> but now you're hearing the discussions among the global humanitarian community, a concern about extreme events, global in scale, cataclysmic, irreversible outcomes. And a new term, mega catastrophe, has just been invoked. You hear this term now. So a new phrase uh, uh, seems to be coming up. The colossal earthquake in Haiti in January 2010 might be a biopsy of the future. This was uh, an e extreme event, huge in scale, incredible mortality, uh, of great challenge, still is, two years later. Port-au-Prince, the capital city, it was a perfect storm of these megatrends that I just mentioned. It's kind of a laboratory for the worst case scenario. <clears throat> Already Haiti is the most disaster prone country in the world. Vulnerable coastline, it's prone to seismic events, susceptible to extreme weather, tropical storms, flash floods, landslides. On average, Haiti suffers a major catastrophe every three years. It should not have caught us by surprise. And it's also pointing out something. There, there's a convenient uh, compartmentalization in the disaster relief, humanitarian assistance world of natural disasters and man-made disasters. Haiti showed us that that distinction is less relevant. All these crises are multifaceted. Haiti had chronic susceptibility to external shocks, intense poverty, urbanization, low levels of national preparedness. The country was not prepared. So now there's another new term, compound vulnerability, that there are populations that have so many factors of vulnerability. When the earthquake struck in Haiti, the country was already recovering from the typhoon season in 2008. In 2008, Haiti experienced the worst hurricane season in Caribbean history four successive typhoons in just 30 days. So it was just uh, barely coming out of that crisis when the earthquake struck. Now, here's something that I just learned uh, <coughs> that I found fascinating, and I'm not, I'm not even sure how to understand this. Talk about, we're expecting that through climate change, we might see an increase uh, of uh, uh, disaster events, as I mentioned, particularly extreme weather events. What does earthquakes have to do with climate change? Well, here's something interesting. University of Miami Marine and Atmospheric Sciences just released a report that hurricanes and typhoons can trigger earthquakes. They found that there's a temporal relationship between these two hazards. Large earthquakes often occur within four years after a tropical cyclone season. Well, that was the case in Haiti. It was just a couple years after that uh, terrible hurricane season I just mentioned. So it turns out, well, what is that mechanism? It turns out that large rainfall causes a lot of erosion, uh, the surface load, landslides, mudslides. So the surface load over a seismic area is lessened by that, and it can unclamp uh, a, a, a fault zone, so they can be, they're more susceptible to a seismic event. This is fascinating. Now, if you think about with the expectation that climate change is going to produce more extreme weather events, increased precipitation in some areas, you'd expect erosion, landslides, slope instability, retreating glaciers, uh, degrading permafrost, so there could be some instability geologically, so it, it's kind of a fascinating notion. Now, on climate change, this is probably the biggest one that gets most of the attention. I read just the other day that nine out of 10 natural disasters are climate-related. So already, 
uh, climate is very important in the natural disaster world. It seems apparent now, I think irrefutable, I hope you believe, that our, our planet has a fever and already it's affecting uh, human populations. In a typical year, 250 million people are affected by climate-related events. 250 million people. That is predicted to increase to 375 million by 2015. Not that far away. Here's where it concerns us. This will overwhelm the global humanitarian system. It will surpass our capability to respond to it. We saw that briefly uh, in 2010 I'm sorry, in 2011, uh, in Pakistan, remember they had those terrible monsoon floods. Then there was uh, the cholera outbreak uh, in Haiti. They happened around the same time. The strain on the humanitarian system was palpable. Uh, there there uh, were, wasn't enough staff, there weren't enough assets, there wasn't enough money to go around. Organizations were stretched. The world supply of tents had run out. You couldn't get enough tents to either of these uh, crises. It's in, I've been a professional aid worker on and off for 30 years. This is the second time I've seen that happen since uh, the Kosovo exodus, that the tent supply actually ran out. Now, with these scarcities of food and water, we'd expect increased armed conflict as a result, as I mentioned, resource wars. We're already seeing that. Drought and water shortages pr exacerbating conflicts in Nepal in Sudan and Afghanistan. Here's an interesting thing. The recent uprisings in the Arab world, now we, we attribute that to a political wave of citizen outrage, right? It turns out that there's an accelerant to this fire. The oxygen of this fire is water shortages, crop failure, and displacement of villages and farmers. These were compounding variables. Let's take Syria, for example. Since 2006, Syria has been experiencing the worst drought and series of crop failures seen in thousands of years. Deficits of water, disaffected rural communities, displacement of hundreds of thousands of villagers and frustrated farmers going towards cities. <coughs> That's one example. Darfur. The first genocide of the 21st century. Some people call Darfur the first environmental conflict. If, any, if you know anything about Darfur, if you look at it on a map, it's in the geographic center of the Sahara Desert. Desertification, competition over dwindling resources were part of this uh, bloodlust uh, that happened uh, in early 2000 in Darfur. And now there's even a term uh, called ecocide, where, where, where climate change uh, is implicated as, as a driver uh, for genocide. So look at now in the Horn of Africa, northern Uganda, Chad, Central African Republic, the border areas between Sudan and South Sudan, there's recurring drought there, and these are inflaming ethnic tensions. So there seems to be some relationship. Africa is more afflicted with climate fever than anywhere else. It's the most vulnerable, least adaptive capacity. The interior temperature rise, we're expecting global rise in temperatures, will happen one and a half to two times greater in the continent of Africa than in other places in the world. So it's particularly vulnerable. Um, the worst crisis right now in the world uh, is the Horn of Africa, Somalia, and the adjacent countries. We recently breathed a sigh of relief. Remember, there was a famine declared last year, uh, just uh, in uh, uh, late December, early January. It was announced that the famine was over. The worst, the peak of that crisis uh, was over, and we breathed a sigh of relief. However, the client scientists from, uh, from Africa's EGAD announced that drought is likely to return in the next three months. In January of this year, highest temperatures ever witnessed in the Horn of Africa uh, in, in the past 13 years were recorded. So it's really quite alarming. 
Rising sea levels, this is another concern. Uh, as Jenna mentioned, my work, uh, I, do, I uh, am an advocate uh, on the UN Security Council, uh, so we work with issues uh, on the Council, lobbying them to pay attention to humanitarian issues. There's a curious debate happening on the Security Council around global climate change and whether that is an issue of global peace and security and should be on the formal agenda of the Security Council. They don't want it. They, there's pushback on that notion, but there are some countries uh, that, are, that are kind of promoting this. An interesting example uh, is the Maldives. The president of the Maldives testified, you may have heard of this just a couple of years ago, he said a sea level rise of 7 to 20 inches will make his nation uninhabitable. More than 80 percent of the archipelago is about a meter above uh, sea level. Now, with the collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, if this happens, sea levels are predicted to rise anywhere from two meters to seven meters, an astounding rise. So this is not a hypothetical scenario. The Pacific Island nations have come together. They formed a pretty effective coalition, and they're lobbying both at the UN General Assembly and Security Council about the implications of, of global sea rise, what it will mean uh, uh, to their nations. They're already experiencing salt water intrusion into their ground, freshwater grounds, uh, groundwater sources, coastal flooding, salination of crops, degrading of coral reefs. They're already experiencing the effects. Tuvalu, Kiribati, the Marshall Islands are predicted to vanish entirely by the end of the century. Already they're having environmental migration in their islands. People are leaving their traditional lands uh, because of the salt water uh, uh, intrusion into their, their water sources, <coughs> diminishing uh, uh, fish catches, loss of livelihoods. Kiribati is already buying land in other countries with a plan to relocate their entire population. Papua New Guinea is evacuating the entire population of its Cataract Islands. And there are other examples of Pacific Island states that are searching for a new homeland, for a new country. Now, living close to an ocean brings substantial risk uh, to, for disaster vulnerability because most catastrophic weather events are coastal events, storm surges, ocean flooding, typhoons, tsunamis. These are coastal phenomena. Now, increasingly, the global population of the world is moving toward coastlines, part of urbanization. Where are most cities in the world? They're located along the coast. Why? Because the planet was settled by sea. So it's natural. If you look at, on NASA, it has a picture of the Earth at night. Have you seen this? It's a fabulous picture. It's completely black, but you can see the trace of every continent because it is traced by the lights of all the cities. It is irrefutable how humans have settled a planet is along the coast. So that's where. So already two thirds of the world's population lives on or within 100 miles of the coastline. In three decades, it'll be as many as six billion people will live along the coast. That's, that will be. 75% of the world's population. So it's really something to, to be aware of. Now, in terms of uh, other trends, always worth mentioning armed conflict. This is uh, uh, the greatest demand at this moment in history for humanitarian agencies. There is, although decreasing amounts and severity of armed conflict around the world, there is still substantial conflicts. One out of every 170 people on planet Earth is a refugee, someone that's been displaced by war. As I mentioned earlier, we expect climate change is going to increase the frequency, duration, and intensity of violent conflict. There's a new kind of radical idea that's been, I've heard at the UN, called green helmets. You know, blue helmets, UN peacekeepers. There's an idea of something called green helmets, kind of a modification of this blue helmet idea. External interveners that show up early to try to de-escalate uh, uh, competition for resources, to try to put them down. I think, 
uh, the, the majority, it was 17 of the last 19 peacekeeping missions were in situations where there was some competition over natural resources. So even now the blue helmets are, are, are f serving this role. But the other thing, okay, about armed conflict is, although there are decreasing armed conflict, that's, that's good to know, we're happy to hear it, there is still problems of the way contemporary wars are fought. Very few of the world's wars are fought by professional trained armies who respect the rules of war, the Geneva Conventions, international humanitarian law. So there's flagrant violations of uh, uh, the sanctity of civilians. Civilians are, de are deliberately targeted. Uh, laws against forced migration. Many conflicts in the world are deliberately causing expulsion ethnic cleansing, uh, the forced migrations of populations. Attacks on schools, attacks on hospitals, aid facilities, the perverse tactics of sexual aggression that we're hearing so much about. These man-made com conflicts are ruthless in the way they're being conducted. A friend of mine uh, is a feminist and she assured me that feminists are not seeking gender parity in the social taxonomy of these armed conflicts. They are man-made disasters, she assures me. Okay, now the, another uh, issue that's uh, growing also in scale, and this is new, is something is organized crime, international organized crime, or it's called organized armed violence is the vernacular. It turns out now that that's actually killing more people than armed conflict. So, m as I mentioned, many of today's wars, not professional armies, they're not ideological confrontations. They're really, if you look at them, they're about uh, illicit commerce, control of natural resources. They're not fights for ethnic identity, political participation, quest for democracy. They're really kind of war economies. They're not mercenaries, they're merchants. They're not insurgents, these are racketeers. Rare right now, it's rare to have a war fought on principles. It's greed, not grievance, is the expression you hear. So there's powerful cartels controlling natural resource extraction, high seas pirate, piracy, drug trafficking, arms trading, people trafficking. The past couple of years, you may have heard of this, in West African coast now, 20 tons of cocaine was smuggled across West Africa with a value of about $900 million. That is more than the GDP of Sierra Leone and Guinea combined. So what we're finding, my own organization is involved in 42 armed conflicts in the world right now. We're, we are in 42 different countries. These are not war zones, these are crime scenes. Our biggest program right now is in the Democratic Republic of Congo. There's a great example of something known as the resource curse, a country that discovers natural riches become cursed. Diamonds, copper, uranium, petroleum, cobalt, gold, hardwoods, these are the things that fuel these wars. So we're now asking, the, the question is no longer who's harmed by war, who's harmed by peace? Why can't we resolve these conflicts? We're looking at the wrong formula. Who benefits from war? There are people, there are winners even when a war is not won. I'll just mention security of aid workers, a growing problem each year. The number of aid programs, humanitarian aid programs around the world that are closed or suspended doubles. It doubles every year and the tactics <coughs> Uh, are increasing in veracity. Targeted killings of aid workers, hostage taking, kidnapping, ambushes, carjacking. In 2008, more aid workers were killed than peacekeepers. This is a Department of Labor statistic. Of the top 10 most dangerous civilian occupations for on the job fatalities for Americans, international relief work is, has the fifth highest death rate. After loggers, pilots, deep sea fishermen, and structural iron, worker, structural iron workers. 
And relief work is the only one where the cause of death is intentional violence, people intending to kill you. So it's really changed. I mentioned Somalia, <coughs> most dangerous humanitarian situation in the world right now. 47 aid workers were killed last year. Many more were kidnapped. Mogadishu, the capital of Somalia, most dangerous city in the world. So it's really changing. And you'll even hear, among the, in the craftsmanship of aid work is now a term called remote control programming. Uh, uh, where, and this is kind of a crazy notion, but uh, one of my colleagues did a uh, back of the napkin calculation. He found that 59% of our uh, uh, projects around the world, we do not deliver directly. We deliver from another country through national uh, charities, organizations, mosque groups, local staff. We have to do it remotely, and there's a whole technology that's come up around how to deliver programs uh, across borders. It's, it's kind of exciting, rather scary though, if you think that so many of our programs are actually not delivering by ourselves. And this is true of all humanitarian agencies. There are many settings in the world right now where we can't go. Uh, I was in Somalia this summer, very rare for any organization to allow an American staff member into Somalia, particularly six, since some of the extremist groups controlling territory there have issued a fatwa against Americans, kill them on site, even aid workers. So it's very, very dangerous. I had, when I visited our programs, I had six armed guards surrounding me everywhere I went. It was, it was crazy uh, how dangerous it is. Uh, let's co talk about urbanization. <clears throat> As I mentioned, uh, Haiti is a great example. Uh, earthquakes typically are not highly lethal events. But Haiti's earthquake ripped through the capital city, very densely populated area. In 35 seconds, 200,000 people were killed because it hit a densely populated area. Now, urbanization is happening rapidly across the world, particularly in Africa and Asia. One mega catastrophe that hasn't happened yet that people are anticipating is Kathmandu, the capital of Nepal. It lies in an active seismic fault. They estimate an earthquake there will produce about 40,000 deaths and about 100,000 people will be injured. Kathmandu's had huge growth, unplanned, poorly coordinated urbanization. Over 5 million people, <laughs> no quake-proof building standards. So there's a real concern about that. Already today, every day, 100,000 people move into slums. The migration into informal settlements is colossal. This is true also of displaced people, of refugees, people affected by war and conflict. They're now moving toward cities rather than the tradition of being in camps. So at this point, more than half of the refugees in the world are living in cities, not in camps. That is inconvenient for a humanitarian aid organization trying to deliver services. The convenience of having one location and a way to do it. So tomorrow's refugee is not going to live under canvas. They're going to live in an urban setting. And then there are problems of urban s these camps becoming cities. This is fascinating. Uh, in northeast Kenya, is a place called the Dab Camp. Have you ever heard of this? The Dab Camp is the world's largest refugee camp. It's in a desolate area of northeastern Kenya. Obviously, Kenya is not going to give prime Kenyan real estate to refugees from Somalia, where most of these refugees are from. This swarming, growing camp of the Dab uh, has now become the third largest city in Kenya. Now you can imagine Kenya's not so happy about that. They didn't plan it, and it's hardly a city by anyone's imagination. But as of today, there are 463,000 refugees in Dadaab camp. That's bigger than Miami. That's bigger than Cleveland. That's bigger than Minneapolis. And even though this sea of tents 
is spread over 50 square kilometers, the population density is greater than Mexico City, greater than Bangkok, and even greater than Singapore. <coughs> this summer, the United Nations High Commission of Refugee, Refugees announced that the third generation of Somali refugees were born in this camp. There are refugees who've been there for more than 20 years in this camp. I was there this summer. Refugees I spoke to said they will never leave this camp. Their children will never leave this camp. This is where they will live for the rest of their lives. Really a unfortunate uh, uh, place. It is a tough place to live. As an American, we think camps is kind of a good thing. It is a dreary, toxic uh, environment. Very dangerous in terms of communicable diseases, very high crime rates, and just the bleakness of lack of opportunity uh, and education. Uh, it's just a shame. Yes, yeah, please. Uh, in regards to the camp to the children who are born there, um, in, in terms of um, nationalization, how does that work out? They're not, uh, America is one of the few countries where you're born here, you become an American. Other countries don't uh, give that privilege. So they're still refugees. They're not integrated. They don't have the right to work, right to own land. Uh, so they're really constrained. So the, there's informal economies in these camps. They're not. Uh, it's not, they're not uneventful or, or entirely dependent on humanitarian aid. Good thing, because they would die. You would die, any of us would die within a week if we lived on a ration that's given out by humanitarian aid organizations. So there's a problem. And they can't go anywhere. There's uh, tremendous uh, prejudices against them. Uh, there are a lot of Somalis who go to the uh, Kenyan cities. Uh, then they have a very tough life uh, uh, because their uh, police uh, extract money from them. And so there's a lot of problems. Let me mention briefly uh, a few more examples. Uh, global pandemics are a real problem. Uh, if you think about it in the last three to four decades, over 30 new diseases that had never existed before. HIV disease, <coughs> hepatitis C, Ebola, uh, mad cow disease, West Nile virus, SARS, new polio strains, Lyme disease, swine flu, H1N1 never existed before. So there's new diseases happening. And reemergence of old diseases, dengue fever, new cholera strains, tuberculosis, malaria. Now, I also want to mention another thing, which is uh, uh, something I'm very interested in, is uh, age demographics. Now, this is something that the disaster relief industry has not yet grasped. There is a certain infatuation with youth. Uh, and you'd see it in our websites. It's a very good way to enchant people to uh, uh, visit us and see the work we're doing. But it might not be representative because the populations of the world are, owed, are aging. Uh, as we know, globally, there's a dramatic demographic shift where it used to be that societies had many children <coughs> and people died young. Now people are having fewer children, but we're living longer. So it might be that right now is the last time in human history when there are more young people than elders. So the youth bulge is nearing its historical peak. Soon the number of people over the age of 65 will outnumber the number of people below the age of five. So older people will outnumber children in the next 10 years. <clears throat> Already globally, it's one of the fastest growing demographics in the world is people over the age of 60. Already, in 2009, there were half a million people in the world over the age of 100, if you can imagine. By 2050, there will be over 2 million centenarians, 2 million people over the age of 100. So it's a real problem. Think about it here in the US, the rapidly aging population Every eight seconds in the United States, someone turns 65. That's 10,000 people a day. It's the fastest growing segment of the US population. So it's creating a problem for caring for them. This critical shortage of healthcare workers around the world, over 60 countries in the world face critical healthcare <coughs> workforce shortages. So demands for caregivers are gonna really change uh, uh, the way social welfare is conducted. I read one book 
that talked about a prediction here in the United States about how our attitudes toward migration will change with this aging demographic. This author said that future healthcare recruiting companies will drive buses to the Mexican border to lure immigrants to come to the United States and take care of us in long-term facilities. And you think about it, it makes sense. That this, uh, the caseload of aging, this gray tsunami, uh, is going to be enormous. In the next, by 2050, more than 100 million people globally will have Alzheimer's disease. If you think about it, over the age of 85, every other person over the age of 85 has Alzheimer's. It's something that happens as you age at this point. 100 million people, that's predicted. How will you care for them? If that was a country, that would be the 12th largest country in the world. 100 million Alzheimer's patients. And this is a problem for my guild, for my field. We're not prepared for it. Already in disasters, our formulary, our drug supplies, our capabilities are emergency oriented for injuries and acute illness. We don't have enough treatment regimens and medications for chronic and non-communicable diseases. It's already increasing the caseload and something that we have to take care of. Let me mention a few other crazy uh, uh, crises in the future, nuclear weapon detonation, dirty bombs. As you know, there's a lot of countries that formally possess nuclear weapons, many more believed to have them, and still more that have secret programs or aspirations. So we're worried about crude radioactive dispersal devices, dirty bombs. It's a crazy idea, but as a worldwide humanitarian aid organization, you have to ask the question, how would we respond to a radioactive event? Do we have the assets and equipment, protective gear, protocols? You know, how prepared are we? That's a, a, a really uh, a, a awesome question to think about. What would we do if there was a radioactive release somewhere in the world? Now here's a crazy one. Now you're going to really think I'm crazy. Cosmic events, out of this world kind of scenarios. I asked a colleague of mine, what would we do, humanitarian agencies, what would we do if there was a meteor impact? Now it might sound crazy, but the word disaster actually comes from the Greek word means bad star, because all bad events were considered to be astrological. Every time you see a shooting star when you look up in the sky, what is that? That's a near-Earth object, right? It's an asteroid coming, burning up uh, in our atmosphere. If you look at, does this ring a bell? No. Uh, if you look at the uh, pocked surface of the moon, there's a convenient sample of how often uh, near-Earth objects happen. Look at it. It's just covered uh, it with asteroid impacts. So it's kind of interesting. Last month, the UN scientists announced they were observing a 460-foot diameter asteroid that is predicted to strike the Earth in 25 years. Now that's a 1 in 600 chance, but it's out there. NASA routinely monitors uh, near-Earth objects larger than a kilometer. And the energy impact of something like this would be horrendous. Uh, if you think about it, the, the mass extinction of dinosaurs that was attributed to an asteroid impact. It killed half of all species on Earth, so it is something to, to raise concern about. A couple years ago, ri Russian scientists actually prepared a deflection mission to go to one of these comets that was coming near Earth. And, and luckily it didn't, but it just shows you there is some reality uh, behind this. I'll mention solar flares. Some of you might be aware, two weeks ago, uh, the solar maximum was as highest. There were s solar flare, uh, uh, flares, the highest seen in the past five years. It is predictable every 11 years the sun goes through this cycle, but it hasn't peaked yet. They're expecting a peak in 2013. In 1989, sunspots caused large power outages in Quebec, affected about 6 million people. People who were in jetliners at the time were exposed to radiation. You might remember uh, 1984, Air Force One, President Reagan was traveling to Japan. They lost communication with Air Force One for several hours during a solar flare. So it could affect 
power grids, satellite communications, GPS. It is something worth uh, thinking about. Now, let me close uh, before we go to questions and talk about the humanitarian response architecture. So what about the global capacities, uh, as I mentioned? It's estimated anecdotally that the world's disaster agencies, humanitarian organizations, could manage under optimal conditions uh, a caseload of a maximum 100 million people around the world. We currently have a beneficiary caseload of about 60 million. So there's not a comfortable red, uh, amount of readiness. But if some of these future projected scenarios come about, we're looking at hundreds of millions of people that would be displaced by some of these events. So it is really huge and something of great concern to us. And so there's a real reflection, moment of circumspection, soul searching among aid agencies about are we prepared? Uh, how are we doing so far? And there's some stark lessons, as I mentioned, our real-time evaluations were critical of our performance uh, already in the last couple of emergencies. 21st century humanitarian assistance is still, the state of the art is still not good enough. We're repeating mistakes from the past. We don't have a sufficient learning culture where we're learning from one emergency to the next. People who work for aid, aid, agencies, aid agencies have very short careers, very short tenures. One colleague calls us the temp agency because people don't stay long in our field. So there's a real problem of professionalization certification, licensing. Uh, so we really, uh, you know, collective learning really have some problems. Then donor trends, where are we going to get our funding? There's increased public skepticism about foreign assistance. Many countries in the world are becoming increasingly uh, isolationist and parochial, favoring domestic spending rather than international spending. So that's going to be a problem. Uh, a lot of donor trends, particularly governmental trends, tend to have a, a, the aid is getting more politicized, more focused on counterterrorism rather than actual humanitarian relief. So there's real problems. We're going to be forced to do more with less. We're going to have less funding, so that's going to be a problem. So let me close before we go to questions. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that these ominous predictions are, are actually not balanced now because it doesn't take into the fact that uh, things are actually better than they ever have been. A lot of these uh, uh, look at the future of the world are, are very much negative trends extrapolated and high-end estimates you know, taken as uh, the average. So there's a bit of a, a skewed uh, look at some of these things. Something, you know, the, the phenomenon of confirmation bias, you just look for things that support your presumption. So we're marshalling the facts to support this notion that the sky is falling, and it might not be entirely true. There's something alluring about that, and it is sensational, but it might not be the truth. The truth of the matter, however, is the, the big picture. The world is experiencing unprecedented abundance and prosperity. It's actually a time of hope and optimism. But as humanitarian agencies, we need to prepare for the worst. Prepare for the worst, hope for the best. But personally, I look forward to the future. The cup is actually half full. Thank you.